Halito, and welcome to Native Chalk Talk, a podcast by Natives for all. Here, we're keeping our Native ancestors' stories and history alive, while also sharing with you our Native cultures, traditions, and more. I'm Rachel Youngman, a Choctaw originally from Anadarko, Oklahoma. I hope you'll enjoy this journey with me as we learn from our Native American guests. And stay tuned for the end of each episode, where we'll talk about some great ways to support Native causes and or Native-owned businesses. Let's get started. You're going to want to hear today's show captured by the Comanche. My guest is a fascinating Comanche gentleman from my hometown in Anadarko, Oklahoma. To me and my sisters, he's known as stirrer of the pot, the orneriest son of a gun this side of the Mississippi. But to the country, Lonnie Henderson has earned the distinction of most decorated Comanche veteran, earning 69 decorations, medals, badges, citations, and campaign ribbons. Lonnie served in the United States Air Force as Master Sergeant in the intelligence field as a ground and airborne cryptographic linguist qualified in Russian, Vietnamese, and German. In 2017, he was designated a code breaker by the Comanche Nation. Stay tuned for more episodes in the future as we also cover our native code talker stories. So Lonnie, we salute you, sir, and thank you for all you've done for our country. It was my pleasure. The Comanche are, in my opinion, the most fascinating of the Plains natives, and your family story sounds like something right out of the book Empire of the Summer Moon, Kwana Parker, and the Rise and Fall of the Comanches, the most powerful Indian tribe in American history. So if anyone listening has not yet read that book after the podcast, go grab yourself a copy of the book, or you can also download the audiobook. Before we get into the fascinating story of your ancestors, Lonnie, why don't you tell us a bit more about the Comanche? The Comanche are a break off of the Shoshone, really. They started uh, in way north of where they are, moved on down south. The territory spread and is known as Comancheria. That area covered quite a large portion of the central, south central local uh, United States from uh, southern Kansas, a little bit of Colorado, a little bit of New Mexico, a lot of Oklahoma, a lot of Texas. Their hunting grounds took them all the way down. Well, actually, not so much their hunting grounds. Their raiding grounds took them all the way into northern Mexico. So it was quite an extensive territory. They are known as the Lords of the Plains because of their expertise with horses and riding. They, they bred horses. They owned a vast horse herds. That was their wealth. And that was one of their primary reasons for raiding was to, how I say, capture somebody else's horses? Well, all right, steal all the people's horses. Let's put it that way. So that's how they came across with <laughs> that term, Lords of the Plains. A young Comanche boy learned to ride before he could walk. By the time he was five years old, he was a very, very good horseman. Women, girls, not so much. They were did more, shall I say, female type work. I won't get into that too much, though. <laughs> I actually think the part about the horses is one of my favorite parts about, as you mentioned, the Lord of the Plains, the Comanche. If you were to read the book, The Empire of the Summer Moon, Lonnie, I know you and I have both read it. And they do talk about how they would even choke the horses and have them pass out and they'd breathe into their nostrils to wake them back up. And they would be from there on out, basically their servant. The horse was the Comanche servant to some degree, but they were a partner as well because they worked together in battle and all of those things. So when you bring up the horse, part, I just, I get really excited. All right, great. Thank you. And I I know we're going to learn a lot more as we go. I can make one comment about about the horses. One of the reasons the uh, Comanche raiding parties were so successful is that they would take more than one horse per person, per warrior. They'd take two or three. When they raided a settlement or some kind of a military establishment, they would do it quickly and then they would head back north. The Texas Rangers or ever who it was in pursuit only had one horse, which quickly tired. And the Comanche would just flat out run them and they ride day and night. So there's no way they could be caught. I know that was part of their success. Wow. So smart. And I mean, isn't it true too, Lonnie, that a lot of the battles that happened over time, they, some of the opposing forces would try to get different tribes to be on their side to help fight the other white man and the natives on the other side. 
because they knew the land so well. They were very good at sneaking up on people and that sort of thing. So really the whole battle thing is even a topic on its own. Some of the tribes were traditional enemies. The Comanche and the Apache did not get along. They were traditional enemies. It was primarily because of the Comanche that the Apache were moved into where they are now, into the desert southwest. The only tribe the Comanche ever had any kind of relationship with was the Kiowa. But the word, and it's kind of interesting, a little bit of history on the word itself, Comanche. That is not a Comanche word. The Comanche people themselves call themselves Numina, which means the people. Comanche comes from a Ute word, which wound up in Spanish as Comancia. Now, what that means, it might add some significance to who they were. That word in Ute means those who always want to fight us. So that was kind of what the Comanches were known for. Fascinating. And you said Numina Numina. is the proper Numina. Numina. All right. We all just learned something. Great. Well, thank you. And so now that we have that bit of information about the Comanche, although I feel like we could have 10 shows about the Comanche alone because they are so fascinating, we know that something very significant happened to your great-grandfather at the age of seven. But first, let's set the scene. What was your great-grandfather's name at the time? At the time of his, well, he was captured at about the age of seven. We don't know what his name was at that time because there are, there's no history. The only history we have is later on with the Comanche, so we don't really know what he was known by at that time. It was a Spanish name of some kind, but we don't really know. And there is a reason for our listeners that I am asking that strange question, so stay tuned. And where was your great-grandfather born? He was born in a northern Mexican uh, province called uh, Coahuila which is right on the Texas border down just across the river from Laredo. And that's where he and uh, his family were living when uh, the Comanche raided their settlement. All right. Well, that's pretty interesting. What year was that, the mid-1800s? That was around 1844 or somewhere in in that time frame. All right. So you and I talked about this, that your great-grandfather and his brother, who was five years old, they were together at the time of this incident we're about to talk about. So tell us what it is that happened to these two brothers. The grading party actually took the younger brother, who was five, Toyope, and took off with him. They didn't take the other brother, my great-grandfather, but he followed them. And eventually they picked him up and took him as well. Apparently, they wiped out everybody else in the village. There's no record of anybody else being taken at that time, which was pretty common with the Comanche, with, they, with not only the Comanche, other, other raiding parties. They would uh, pretty much kill all the men, might take the women as trading material or even as a wife, but would take the children. And one reason they took especially the male children was to replace their own warriors who had been lost in battle. And that was part of it. They would raise them as a Comanche and then adopt them into the tribe. That's exactly what happened to my great-grandfather and his brother. Wow, that's fascinating. It must have been terrifying for these boys. And your great-grandfather was so brave to go follow them and make sure that his brother, Toyope, did not get away from his sight. So pretty interesting. So as many of us know... When we are studying our ancestor stories, especially when we have Native American ancestors, I've spent 12 years plus (laughs) researching my own family. And of course, we're so limited on some of the things that go back as far as, you know, you're talking about 1844. So you have a lot of more information than some of us do. You know, it really is hard to know all the details, like from the emotional standpoint, what were the boys thinking at the time? Did they see their parents be killed and their community being raided and all of those things that we assume they were, but we don't know those things and we may never know. Let us also remember, though, the Comanche, as you mentioned earlier, Lonnie, they lived in Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Colorado, and New Mexico. And the government had actually tasked settlers with building forts throughout Texas right in the middle of Comanche territory, hoping these settlers could eventually make some progress in colonization. So the Comanche's territory was being infiltrated by the outsiders. So they were in their territory and the Comanche saw it as, hey, you're fair game. You're on our land. All right. And back to this. So the boys lived with the Comanche for the remainder of their lives, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Wow. And what else do you know about the stories of their time growing up with the Comanche? Is there anything more that you know about that? 
I have, in, in various books about the Comanche Nation, about Fort Sill, for instance, uh, various books uh, such as that, the name comes up from time to time as being in a raid or as part of a raid or as a leader of a band or something like Gray Mountain or Esotoya, my great-grandfather, was the leader of a, one of the bands at one time. So you'll see that name from time to time. But other than that, we don't know a whole lot about that life. We know what happened once uh, once allotments were made and he moved on to his allotment. We know what happened since then, but that inter- intervening period, no, we don't know. And that makes total sense. As we mentioned, there's so little that most people do know. And I think you actually know a lot more than some. So good job on your research and the stories that have been passed down within your family. So yeah, let's get to that. The name that you just mentioned, Esatoya. So that was a name given to him by the Comanche, correct? That is correct. He was given the name Esatoya, which is two words in Comanche that translates into English as Gray Mountain, which is what he was known by. And as this is the case with many Native Americans, there will be two or three family names or two or three names from the same family, but still the same person. We have family members known as Gray Mountain. We have family members known as Asatoyer, which is a mutation from Esatoya. So you're going to have them all through there with, with those names. That's the only name I know him or I, that I've found that I know him by. Such a good, strong name, that Gray Mountain. I like it. Something to be proud of. (laughs) So I mentioned earlier one of my favorite books, Empire of the Summer Moon. And by the way, that's by S.C. Gwynn. It was common for Native American tribes, as it mentions in the book, to raid camps of other tribes and or the homes and communities of the white people. The book details the true story of the life of Quanah Parker, whose white mother, Cynthia Ann Parker, was taken by the Comanche and integrated into the tribe. And if you grew up in Oklahoma like me and like Lonnie, Quanah's history was well studied in school. I loved Quanah, you know, learning about him when I was growing up. Cynthia Ann Parker, his mother, she married Chief Peta Nakona. I'm probably messing up that name, but he was the Comanche chief at the time. And they bore Quana and later his sister Prairie Flower. And even though Cynthia Ann's white family was able to retrieve her back from the Comanche, she still went back to the tribe. And that was her own choice. I find that very fascinating. So then Quana grew into a great warrior. And he and his Comanche family attacked settlers, raiding, killing, and taking captives, as Lonnie mentioned. And when the government was trying to assign the tribes to different reservations in the mid-1800s, Quanah's band fought back, which led to the Red River Indian War. Again, he was a great warrior. So eventually, though, the Comanche, led by Quanah, surrendered at Fort Sill. Another thing that Lonnie had mentioned, I'm going to talk about in just a second, too. So Quanah knew that if they did not surrender, the Comanche would be fully wiped out. And it really is a sad scenario. They had to give up basically their way of life, their raids, their entire community's way of life to basically stay alive. And as we know, with a lot of tribes, as they had to do back then. So because Quana was both native and white, he attempted to kind of be that liaison and bridge the gap between the two parties. And he was really instrumental in getting the other bands to surrender as well. And eventually he became the first principal Comanche chief. Quana later died in 1911 at Fort Sill in Oklahoma. And by the way, Fort Sill is in Lawton, Oklahoma, is where my dad worked after he left Riverside Indian School and he retired from Fort Sill. So we spent a lot of time on the base, which is filled with Native history since the Army took Native captives and held them there for quite a long time, a couple of generations, maybe more. And Quana and his mother are buried there along with other Comanche, Kiowa, and Apache. In fact, Geronimo is also buried there. So we always visit that grave as well at Fort Sill. But I was just thinking, Lonnie, how you said earlier that the Comanche and the Apache were not friends. And yet here they were, they brought them together at Fort Sill. Can you imagine what that community looked like on the base (laughs) with those two warring tribes now having to come together and make peace? So once again, I highly recommend learning more about the Comanche and Quanah Parker in the book, again, called Empire of the Summer Moon. I highly recommend it. So let's get back to your story, Lonnie. Who did Esatoya, also known as Gray Mountain, that's your great-grandfather, who did he marry? According to the records that we have, he was married five times. 
the first four, we have the names, and I've got their birth dates, and in some instances, the, the date of birth. However, we know very little more about them, and it's kind of interesting and perhaps amusing. The two of them, all the, all the records say is they died before allotments, which allotments were in 1902. The other two it said they divorced Indian style. I have never been able to figure out what Indian style actually is. It could very well be that Esatoya went out hunting one morning and came back and found his moccasins outside the tent. And that meant... You know it. I'm done with you. <laughs> We're divorced. But that's a guess on my part. The fifth It's wife, a lot cheaper than the white man's divorce. <laughs> <laughs> the fifth wife, Henaveke, which is Spanish for Genevieve, was my great-grandmother. And they were married and produced seven children, of one of which was my grandmother. Of those seven, one died at a fairly young age, one died at about 19, and five of them received allotments when, when, the, when the reservation was broken up and allotments were made in 1902. Those allotments were between present-day Anadarko and Cement in Oklahoma, in southwestern Oklahoma. Actually, that's a great point to stop there on for some of our listeners who may not know what allottees or allotment means, would you describe that for us? A couple of things that you will run across if you do any history on the Indians is the Dawes Act and the Jerome Act. Both of these acts were measures to break up the reservation lands, give the individual Indians, anyone with a head right, and that was everybody, a certain amount of land and then take what they called unassigned lands and open it up to white settlement. That brought about the land rush in Oklahoma. And the same thing happened with other tribes. But that's how the allotments came about. My great-grandfather and five of his children were each given 160 acres of land there in the same southwest Oklahoma, as were all, all the other Comanches and other tribal members, the Kiowa, the Apache uh, as well. Yeah, great history there on the land allotments and something that a lot of people who, if you are researching your family history, sometimes you can just go to say, just Google Dawes, D-A-W-E-S, and look to see if you've got any family member names that you can find in there. And sometimes you'll find that maybe one of your family members was on that. They enrolled into the Dawes roles and then they were able to eventually get their land allotments. So a lot of us, again, still have that land in our family family. It's very special, um, more for sentimental reasons than anything for a lot of us. And so we're very proud of that family. So this has been so fascinating to learn about the history of the Gray Mountain family and how crazy is it that because the Comanche, they were going to raid that community, but because they kept Esatoya and his brother, that you are here today. Pretty fascinating. So on another note, you have honored your ancestors by serving our country and by other means such as motivational speaking, words of poetic tribute to those who have served our country. And I've also just been amazed by your artistic skills. For our listeners, Lonnie hand carves war lances and clubs and also sculpts. So much talent there. The house in which my sisters and I grew up was burned down recently, actually. And Lonnie took some of the beams and created beautiful wooden pieces of art. I have mine on my library shelf today. Very special. And so you said it's okay for folks to look you up on Facebook so they can see some of the things that you've crafted and the tributes you've created. So feel free to check them out on Facebook. Just look for Lonnie Henderson from Anadarko, Oklahoma. And we thank you for your time, my Comanche friend, O stirrer of the pot. I learned so much and I hope our listeners did too. So now go out there and stir up some more trouble. I'll do my best. (laughs) Thanks, Lonnie. And now a word from our sponsors. The Choctaw Nation has always provided a foundation upon which a future can be built. From our home in Southeast Oklahoma to a bingo hall that grew to be one of the largest casinos in the world. Today's summer school programs lay the groundwork for a love of learning. Small business programs support local economies. And with over 10,000 jobs created, Choctaw offers financial stability to tribal members and our neighbors. Together we build success, because together we're more. Potential is everywhere in the Choctaw people. It's in our schools and students. It's in our small businesses and entrepreneurs. 
Potential is in our lifestyle and health. It's in our culture and heritage. Passion and commitment is in our blood. Ingenuity and economy are a tradition. And the Chutha Foundation was founded for this potential. To cultivate minds and hearts, to stimulate ideas and passions, to extend lives and improve health through education, and to preserve and promote the power of our past. The Chatta Foundation, meeting the potential of the Choctaw people. Thanks for listening to Native Chalk Talk. Be sure to join our community on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Simply search for Native Chalk Talk. That's Native, C-H-O-C-T-A-L-K. And check us out at nativechalktalk.com. Stay tuned for the next episode. You're going to love it. Yakoki. Thank you, my friends.